Hi, have you ever been told that you're always angry? Do you feel like you lose your mind all the time? That you just can't control your anger? Well, hang around for this video because by the end of this video, I will let you know the answer to how to overcome anger, but also what, how to distinguish between what is anger and what is not anger. Hang around. <laughs> Okay, welcome. Welcome to Lions Raw 38 Ministries. My name is George Magalhães, and if you're new here, uh, this is an apostolic ministry with a prophetic teaching edge. It is our passion, our mission uh, to reignite, equip, and release Christ like disciples both locally and globally. We do that through ministry worldwide, but we also do it through resources and videos just like this one where we aid you, we help you in your God-given calling. But just before I get into our topic today, I just want to let you know that I am going to give you uh, the answer to not only overcoming anger, but how to distinguish between what is anger and what is not anger. Uh, and at the end, hang around at the end, I will give our time for the collective, we call it the collective, which is a time at the end of this message where I spent some time praying for you guys. So if you have any prayer requests, please have them on right now so that by the end, uh, towards that collective time, um, I'll have the time to, to pray for you. Amen. So let's get right into it. Okay. So I put the title of today's message, Angry Question Mark. Why? Are you always, like I said at the beginning, do you always feel like you're losing your head? Do you feel like you've got an anger issue? You may not admit it, but other people tell you that. Well, the Bible, the Word of God says, let's bring that up, says Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. I want us to focus on this verse. This is the key verse for tonight. Ephesians 4, verses 26 to 27 says, and by the way, I'm going to be uh, uh, ministering today out of many different Bible translations. So as I minister, you're probably going to go, if you're looking at your Bible or your phone, whatever you're looking at, you're probably going to go, my, my Bible doesn't say that. It does. It's just that I picked all these Bible verses from different types of translations so it would fit today's message more appropriately. So um, if I say, for example, RSV, I'm talking about one of the Bible translations, just to give you a hint. <laughs> okay, so Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 says, Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, if we look at this, we see already a couple of points that we need to take into account. It says, be angry. So it's actually giving us consent to be angry. So are you allowed to be angry? First point, yes, you are. But do not sin. That's the second point. So in your anger, it tells you, the word of God says, do not sin. You're allowed to be angry. But don't allow it to get to a point where you sin. That's the second point. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So it's telling you, by the end of the day, make sure you've dealt with that anger. Make sure you've dealt with that sin if it got to that point. That's the third point. And then it says, and give no opportunity to the devil. That's giving you the consequence of, the, of those three points. If you get angry and then you sin and then you don't deal with it, you are opening up and giving an opportunity for the devil. Let's get into it. Yes? Okay. So, we looked at Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. But, I've also got, as we stated now, I've also got a few more scriptures I want to touch on. But just before I touch on those... 
let me establish what I was trying to say at the beginning. In that verse alone, in that scripture alone, we see that God actually does give us consent to be angry. So what does that mean, George? Well, that means that there is a righteous anger. Some of you may have heard this before, or a righteous indignation. So a righteous anger, and there is an unrighteous anger. So there is a good anger, and there is a bad anger. I'm going to start with unrighteous anger, because I want you to, to, to the last thing to be on your mind, to be the righteous anger, which one you are allowed to exercise, I guess. <laughs> okay? Unrighteous anger. Now, the characteristics of an unrighteous anger, what I'm giving you right now, is how do you distinguish between what is from God and what isn't? So, as I said at the beginning, if you feel like you're always angry, if you feel like people are telling you, man, you, you lose it qu too quickly, you're always angry, you're... And if you feel yourself that you're like, man, I can't control this. I, I, I just explode too quick. The first key needs to be, you need to search yourself. You need to look at yourself and, 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 and distinguish. You have to have a discernment in distinguishing. Is this from God or is this a flesh anger? Is this a righteous anger that comes from God? Or is this a manly anger, a, a, a flesh anger that is an unrighteous anger that obviously doesn't come from God? How do we do that? Well, the characteristics of an unrighteous anger is rage, wicked, and apathetic. Rage, wicked, and apathetic, which leads or seeks, this is the key, seeks destruction. If your anger leads you to rage, leads you to very wicked thoughts and wicked actions, it leads you to being apathetic towards the the um, you know the destruction that the, the the bad things that other people are going through yet you're apathetic to it and you seek destruction you seek the destruction of others because of that anger that is an unrighteous anger because what it does is it promotes self-interest it protects self-interests and it reflects evil and sinful behaviors behaviors that is obviously not from God. Let me give you some examples. Let's look at the Word of God again. In Genesis 4-5, C-E-B, that's the translation, C-E-B says in Genesis 4-5, but didn't look favorably on Cain and his sacrifice. Cain became very angry and looked resentful. What is this talking about? This is talking about that story between the two brothers, Cain and Abel. And they, uh, they would bring their sacrifices to God Yet God was looking more fav favorably upon Abel's sacrifices and not upon Cain. Cain got jealous because of this. That's what this, this is talking about. And in his anger towards God, we end up finding out, we know the story afterwards, that he became so angry towards God not favoring him that he killed his own brother. That's one example. That's an unrighteous anger. Again, let's look at Genesis 39. 19 to 20, Genesis 39, 19 to 20, says in the NLT, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. What is this talking about? This is talking about Joseph. Remember Joseph uh, with all the brothers who sold him, sold him. Uh, sold him out, and eventually he ended up in the Potiphar, uh, Potiphar's house in Egypt. He was a servant there. But Potiphar's wife, she out of lust, she seduced him. But he was a righteous man. He did not want to sleep with her. So he held back. But then she pretended when her husband came, she pretended. She ripped her own clothes and she pretended that he had violated her. She lied to him. In his fury, in his unrighteous anger, because it was such an unrighteous anger, it was... It was he was so furious, as the word says, he was so enraged by it that he became blinded. He was not even not even able to analyze the situation appropriately because he allowed that anger to step over that line that we were talking about. He allowed it to become rage. He allowed it to become a sin. And as a result, he punished an innocent person. Let's continue. Psalms 37, 8 in the CJB says... Stop being angry. Put aside rage and don't be upset. 
it leads to evil. That's unrighteous anger. Stop being angry. Put aside rage. And don't be upset. It leads to evil. Proverbs 15, 18 in the ICB says, A person who quickly gets angry causes trouble. But a person who controls his temper stops a quarrel. But a person who controls his temper stops a, a, a quarrel. What did we say at the beginning? Let's go back to it again. In Ephesians 4, 26, 27 says, Be angry, but do not sin. That is the key there. But do not sin. What does that mean, George? Well, in that verse that we just read, it says, But a person who controls his temper. Self-control is important. You're allowed to be angry. But you must have self-control. How do we get self-control? Well, you can control yourself. You can. And if you feel like you're out of control, obviously if you're watching this video, you want to know who that, and you'll probably have a lot of moments like that. You ask God, Lord, help me have self-control. Give me peace. Give me patience. Help me to cool down. Help me to, to, to analyze the situation appropriately. Help me to rely on your spirit, on your words. But be ready. If you pray that prayer, be ready because he will give you opportunities to exercise that. That's the only way we learn is through opportunities. Okay, so let's read that again. A person who quickly gets angry causes trouble. So we need to be careful that we don't quickly get angry and we don't allow it to get out of hand. But a person who controls his temper stops a quarrel. And the last one, sorry, the second to last one, Esther 3.5. Esther 3.5 in the message version says, When Haman saw for himself that Mordecai didn't bow down and kneel before him, he was outraged. Meanwhile, having learnt that Mordecai was a Jew, See it there? Haman hated to waste his fury on just one Jew. He looked for a way to eliminate not just Mordecai, but all Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Circes. What does that mean? See, he got angry because Mordecai, this is the story of uh, Esther. Mordecai was Esther's uncle. And we end up finding out that Haman ends up tricking the king and he almost ended up not only killing Mordecai but almost wiping out the whole Israel. Thank God God appointed Esther and Esther stepped up. But Haman allowed his anger to be to overcome him. He allowed his anger to get to a point of rage and revenge. He had no self-control and he wanted to kill not only Mordecai but the whole of Israel. This is crazy. He wanted to eliminate as the word says not just Mordecai, but all Jews throughout the kingdom. Wow. And the last one, Colossians 3.8. Why am I giving you these verses? Because, as I said at the beginning, it's important that you distinguish between what is a righteous anger and what is an unrighteous anger. Because there is a righteous anger and there is an unrighteous anger. Unfortunately, there are... And I'm not trying to be critical here. There are a lot of churches out there that, that they think that God is just love and everything is nice and beautiful and we're just a bunch of butterflies and we're sensitive to everybody. Everybody's love. And they forget. I don't know what they're reading, but they forget that uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is just as much love as He's just as much just. He's just as much compassionate as He's just as much discipline. In fact, the word says, the word of God says that those he loves, he chastens. What does that mean? Those he loves, he disciplines. Yes, he does. And that's for our own good. However, don't think that if you're doing something wrong, he's going to strike you down. He's not that sort of God. You're on his side. You belong to him. When God brings justice, he keeps his people safe. What did he do in Egypt when he came with that spirit of death? When he came with that cursing the, 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 the firstborn children and came with all those different curses? His people, his people who were covered by the blood, he spared them. Likewise, if you are on God's side, if 
you've given your, your life to God, God will spare you because you belong to Him. But we need to distinguish, we need to understand these things. It's important we understand, how do we understand it? Through the Word of God. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, reciproca reciprocating, I'm just uh, uh, being God's voice, His mouthpiece and telling you His Word. Amen? So, Colossians 3.8 says in the TPT, the Passion Translation, that's how... That's how you once behaved, characterized by your evil deeds. But now it's time to eliminate them from your lives once and for all. Anger and fits of rage, all forms of hatred, cursing, filthy speech. What is this talking about? You were once before, you were maybe a drunk. You were maybe, I don't know, hitting your partner, hitting your wife, or her wife hitting your husband, or... You were just losing it before, but you are not that anymore. See, how you see yourself is important as well. You need to see yourself through the eyes of God. God says you are now His righteous son or His righteous daughter. You are now the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. But George, I'm still doing these things. That does not change who you are. Don't judge your standing with God based on your actions. Judge your actions based on your standing. It's a different story. Don't judge your standing. You're now standing righteously before God because of what Jesus done on the cross. You are now a righteous son or a righteous daughter of God. It doesn't matter what you do for the rest of your life. You are righteous because he says you are righteous. I'm not saying those the sins don't matter. Please don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is your standing does not change based on what you do. Your standing now belongs to Jesus. Your standing now is based on the good works of Jesus. What he's done has made you a son or a daughter of, of, of God. You are now in the right standing. In fact, the word says that you're now a king, a priest, an ambassador of Christ Jesus. So you're in the right standing. In, from your right standing, you judge your actions. Amen? hope that makes sense. <laughs> All right, so we've spoken about unrighteous anger. Now you know how to evaluate it, how to assess it, how to, to uh, be able to pick it up, be able to see, okay, is this from God or is this from the flesh? Is this from the enemy? But what is righteous anger then, George? Okay, let's get to it. I was about to get to it. Go on, be patient, guys. I'll get to it. <laughs> okay, righteous anger. Righteous anger... Its characteristics is indignation, displeasure, and compassion. So indignation, displeasure, and compassion, which seeks restoration. See, one sought destruction, revenge, vengeance, etc. Righteous anger seeks restoration. As I said, and as I say in many of the videos, you can get angry at people who do really stupid things or what did I say in the last video? I said, look, you bless the person and you curse the demon behind them. Because that's the truth. A lot of the times people don't even realize they're either being oppressed or possessed by spirits, by bad things, doors that they have opened in their lives. Sometimes it's just the enemy that hasn't stopped like Job. Read the book of Job and you'll see Nevertheless, if they're apathetic towards people, if they're doing something evil towards people, when you see something bad, when you see a person being taken advantage of, for example, if you saw a person being taken advantage of, and you know that you know that that person is actually being trafficked, that that, that person is being used and being trafficked as a human trafficking, you've got every right from God. In fact, it's your responsibility to speak up. I'm not saying to put your life at risk. You call the right right authorities. It's it's uh, your responsibility to do something about that. I'm just trying to make a point here. I'm just trying to make a point. Because if you truly do love people, and if you truly do have God inside of you, Jesus himself, I'm going to give you Bible verses, you're going to see Jesus himself. He wasn't just walking around like a pretty dove and carrying feathers. and, and, and Come on, man. It, 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 let's be real here. He wasn't. He stood up for justice. Man, did he stand up for justice. Let's get into it. Characteristics of righteous anger. Indignation, displeasure, compassion, which seeks restoration. So even the person 
themselves that are doing the bad things. You'll look at them with anger, but you'll feel like, Lord, help that person. Open their eyes to see so that they can see the, the, the harm that they're doing. See, you're seeking restoration, not destruction. That reflects God's perspective. It reflects God's hatred of evil and sin. Does Oh my God, God hates. Yes, God hates and God loves. God loves doing good things. God loves his people. But God hates evil and sin. He hates it. He has to. Because if he's just, he has to hate it. His righteousness is holy. He's pure. He's truth. And reflects God's love for justice. God loves justice. God will not stand and see his people being taken advantage of for too long. What do you mean by that, George? Well, we have to understand that God's given us his people, his creation, authority over the earth. And he gives us time and he gives us many opportunities to, to, take, a, to take authority over those things. But when we become apathetic to it, sometimes he steps in. And when he steps in, he comes with justice. It's better that we take control and authority and, and, and solve those issues with his help than when he steps in. Let's get into the word. Psalm 711, New King James Version. Psalms 711 says, God is just. He's a just judge. And God is angry with the wicked every day. What? Yes, it's in the Bible, people. It's his very word. God is a just judge. And God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, if you get more deep into this into this verse, you'll see that when it's talking about this, it's saying, with the wicked. Who are the wicked? The ones who are, who are openly doing something bad. They know they're doing something bad, and they don't care. They're just doing it. They know it's bad, but they don't care. If you make a mistake, or you do something because you, 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 you're still struggling through, a, through, I don't know, an addiction or whatever, that's different from being wicked. Because if you're suffering from an addiction, or if you're suffering from, I don't know, alcoholism, and after drinking, you feel really guilty about it. You're not a wicked person. You're just, you're actually sick. You, you, there's, there's a sickness there and you require God's help. But wickedness is when you know that you know you're doing something bad, yet you continue to do it. You know it comes with destruction against that. You, you just don't care about anybody but yourself. That's wickedness. I like what the voice version of the Bible says. It says, God is a just judge. He passes judgment daily against the person who does evil. Wow. Psalms 145 verse 8 in the YLT. Psalms 145 verse 8 says, Gracious and merciful is Jehovah, slow to anger, patient, and great in kindness. He's patient. Like I said, he will give us the opportunity to step in. He gives us the opportunity to take authority that he's given us together to cooperate with him. But he will not stand back and allow his children. He will not stand back and allow anyone innocent to be taken advantage of. Matthew 21, 12 says, Then Jesus, Matthew 21, 12, in the New King James Version says, Then Jesus went to the temple of God, and drove out, oh, oh, yep, drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, and overturned the tables for of the money changers, and the seats of those who sold doves. He drove them out. He overturned the table of uh, and money, uh, of the money changers, and the seats of those who sold doves. I like this version, the Amplified Version, John 2.15 2, says, He made whips of cords. What? He made whips. He entered the temple. He found some cords, people. He made whips of them. Whoa, God, Jesus, made whips of them. And he drove them out. He drove them out, whipping them. He drove them out. This is what it says. He made whips of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their table. Do you think he was doing this as fluffy and... Seriously, people. 
No. And I'm not saying you. I'm saying there are a lot of people out there that I, I, I just can't understand what Bible they're reading. I believe in unity, not, not uh, uniformity. I believe in unity in the body of Christ. But there's, there's, there's some people out there that seriously... <laughs> it's in the Bible, it's very clear. God is just as just as He is love. He... We, oh my God, can you imagine this? Can you imagine Jesus walking into the temple and going, what are they doing? They're making the house of God. They're making this into, a, into like a market. They're, they're taking advantage of the people. They're selling them stuff so they can sacrifice to, to people. What are they doing? They're making a mockery of my father's house. So he, he, he made a whip out of cords he found and then he whipped them out. He drove them out and the animals out. Lifted all the tables up and scattered all the coins. That is an unrighteous anger because he did not like that people were being taken advantage of. He loves justice, remember? Mark 3 5. Mark 3 5 says in the Amplified Version, after looking around at them with anger, who was this? Jesus again. After looking at them with anger, he looked at them, he was angry, like, how can you be so apathetic? How can you be so cruel? After looking at, around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness and arrogance of their hearts, he told the man, this man that was right in front of him, hold out your hand. And he held it out and his hand was completely restored. Let me complete with James 1.19. James 1.19 in the voice uh, uh, interpretation says, Know this, my beloved brethren, let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Sorry, that's a RSV. And the voice says, and don't get worked up into a rage so easily, my brothers and sisters. Don't get worked up into a rage so easily, my brothers and sisters. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. We read this out at the beginning. Ephesians 4. 26 to 27 says, Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So we must first, as I said, we must first look at our situation and go, Okay, what is this? What is this that I'm feeling? Is it a righteous anger or is it an unrighteous anger? And then we need to deal with it accordingly. If it's an unrighteous anger, we need to cool ourselves down. We need to... Call it whatever you like, center, whatever. We need to call upon God and go, Lord, I need your help right now. Call me down. Help me, Holy Spirit. Help me. And don't act. Don't speak. Don't do anything until you're more cooled down. A lot of the times that's the problem is that we feel this... This anger and this fury and, and we act, we say something and in the and by the time we realize it's too late and we just keep going. It's like a roller coaster and we just keep going, we just keep digging ourselves deeper. But God's given us his word and his word is it guides us into understanding, gives us knowledge and understanding and wisdom. So that's why I said as soon as you feel that situation, call upon God and go, What is this? Is this from you? Does this Lord, does this seek destruction? Look at the characteristics. Is this seeking self-interest? Is this a selfish motive, Lord? Is this something I'm doing for myself? Uh, am I seeking destruction and vengeance and rage against that person? Then you'll know that's definitely unrighteous anger. Or am I, or am I just angry at the, the injustices of the way they're treating people, of the way that this, this is happening? And if it's in that manner, it's usually you seek restoration. You actually, you'll end up having a heart to pray for those who are actually doing the wrong as well. You say, not only save those that are being punished, but Lord, that are being persecuted, but Lord, open the eyes of the persecutors, open the eyes of those people. That's, an, that's a righteous anger. Now, with that said, I want to give you an opportunity. I forgot to say that at the beginning of the video, but that's okay. If you're new here, I want to give you the opportunity to grab two free gifts. Now, these two free gifts that you can grab in this video, they're Free gifts, no strings attached, eternal gifts. Take them, you'll keep them, it's yours forever. 
Nobody can take these gifts away from you, unless you allow them to. It's yours forever. Let me... Let me get into them. First gift, Romans 10 verse 9 says, in Romans 10 verse 9, we read that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What has that got to do with anger? Everything. Anger is not just the issue that you're going through right now. If you're watching this video, it's for a reason. This is a divine appointment. It's not a coincidence. God has brought you to this point for a reason. Whether it's you're watching it live or whether you're watching it one week, two days, several months, years down the track. God is not limited by time. And this has been made intentionally for you. This is a free gift of salvation. You don't need to make yourself perfect before you come to Him. He's, he's telling you right now. All you need to do is come to me as you are. I love you. I'm seeking you. Let me tell you this. God, God the Father, He wants you. Jesus has got you. And the Holy Spirit is for you. What does that mean? God, seriously, He wants you. He thought about you even before you were born. He loves you that much. That much. He wants you and He will never stop pursuing you. That's how much He loves you. You're His prized possession, His workmanship, His masterpiece, as He says in Ephesians 2.10. Jesus has got you. What does that mean? He's got your back. He's got you covered already. What He did coming down here on earth, dying on your behalf, dying on my behalf for our sins, taking it upon Himself, exchanging our sins, our sinful nature for His righteousness. That's an amazing gift. That's an amazing thing he did. He conquered, as the word of God says, he conquered the curse of sin and death. And then he rose again. Resurrection life to give us a new life. Do you want that new life today? All you need to do is confess with your mouth. Whatever God puts in your heart. You don't have to repeat after me any specific prayer. Just cry out to, you, to him from your heart. You just say, Lord Jesus, I am tired of this life. I want you to come into my life. Something along these lines. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I choose to believe that you came and you died for my sins so that I would not have to suffer like this any longer. So that I would not have to be a slave to sin, depression, anger any longer. So I accept what you did. I accept the cross. I accept the resurrection life. I accept, accept your gift of salvation. I am now free. I belong to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And with that prayer, out of your heart, I welcome you into the kingdom family. And the word of God says that as soon as you do, do that, that there is a party in heaven for every soul that comes to God. He really does want you. Jesus really do, has your back. And the Holy Spirit is for you. And that's the next free gift. Now that you've given your life to God, that's the first gift. You've got a second gift that a lot of people forget about this, but this gift, gift is really important. Why? Because you, you have a mission. from the Even before he, you were created, every single one of us have a mission. Every single one of us have a purpose in our lives. Otherwise, God will just get us saved and take us straight to heaven. But He leaves us here for a purpose. We have a mission to fulfill. And in order to fulfill that mission, the Word of God says that we do not, we do not uh, battle against flesh, but against spiritual principalities. Whether you believe it or not yet, whether you've experienced or not yet, you will. Let me tell you that, you will. There is a spiritual battle for the souls of people. There is good and there is an evil. There is a God and there is definitely a devil. And the devil does have his minion demons running around thinking that they are just as powerful. But you know what? Both the devil and his minions are under our feet. Now that you've given your life to God, let me tell you something, people. Let me tell you something, brother and sister. You are more powerful right now than you've ever been. You have the power to step on those cockroach, the devil and his minions. He's under your feet now. But... In order to walk around with that spiritual battle, with that spiritual cover, in order to be able to establish His kingdom here on earth, as, as Jesus said, as it is in heaven here on earth, 
in order to overcome those those battles that we face because the bible tells us that the, the devil will never stop he's like a roaring lion waiting to pounce on you he's always trying to bring destruction he's always trying to deceive us he's always trying to to, to stop us from walking the ways of God, from from even being being a witness of God to others. We need specific tools to use, spiritual tools. And these tools is what I'm going to read to you now. In John 20, 21 to 22, it says, Then Jesus said to them, to his, to his disciples, said to them again, May you have peace. As the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. See, there is the mission there. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Why do we need to receive the Holy Spirit? As I said, there is a spiritual battle going on. And when, this, when the Holy Spirit comes, it's not just for the battle. It's also for, your, for our character, for our growth, for our relationship with God. He comes in us and he lives in us. From the moment you give your life to God, you can ask. And, and, Jesus, and God says that in his word. He's very clear. He says, those that one, if you really want, just ask and, the, and God will give you the Holy Spirit. So now, the same way you've done it before, you just say, Lord, I want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want you, Holy Spirit, to come and live in me. And what he's going to do, I'm going to do a prayer for you. And what he's going to do, he's going to do that, exactly. He's going to bring, the Holy Spirit is going to come down and he's going to live inside of you. And then you're going to find yourself in, in situation. You, you will know the difference anyway. You will, Some of you will feel... An electricity as I pray some of you will feel like a warmth some of you will feel like wow like a big burden just got off you some of you may not feel anything doesn't mean he's not there but he is definitely coming it's he promises his word is yes and amen he never fails to fulfill his word so if you ask him now as I pray just in your heart just say yes I receive it Lord I'm gonna pray for you just stay quietly, receive, whether it's your hands up like this in a receiving mode or whether it's your hands to your chest, whatever you want to do. But just be in a receiving mode. I'm going to pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what he's going to do, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit, in due time, as you grow in your relationship with God, he's going to reveal things to you. He's going to reveal other tools that we can use, like the spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues, prof prophecy, uh, gifts of wisdom and, 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 and faith and, and miracles, all those sort of things, as well as his spiritual armor, all those things he'll reveal to you and he will teach you not only through the word, but through the spirit himself. He will begin to speak to you through dreams, through visions, and even through your, through your spirit. He will put a word into your mind or he'll give you a vision, whatever. Are you ready? Okay, just be in a receiving mode. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, with the authority that you've given us, You've given us, given us authority over all things, including the power of the enemy, so nothing shall by any means touch us. Right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're, you're just so amazing. Right now, Holy Spirit, fall upon your children right now. Possess them with your presence right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, our God is a consuming fire. Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, I declare fire over your children right now. Fire over your children right now in Jesus' name. Fire, Lord. Fire in Jesus' name. From head to toe, inside and out. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations. Like I said, now... The Holy Spirit is going to reveal things to you. It may seem a little bit awkward at the moment. Sometimes you may even think it's all, oh, it's just, what, what do they call it? It's, um, I have this feeling or this is deja vu or whatever. I, I forgot all the other words. Um, it's not. God will speak to you and you will know because you know when it's your own thoughts, when you make things up or when it's someone else just bang, pops things in, in your head. And it's going to be God and you'll know because he's also going to teach you how to discern. He's going to teach you things. He doesn't leave you out there in the dry. He won't. He promises now that he's come and lived inside of you. He promises that he'll never forsake you. In fact, the word of God says that though our mother and father forsake us, ye will never forsake us. Amen. Congratulations again if you've prayed those prayers today and received those two gifts. Hallelujah. Welcome to the kingdom family. I encourage you to please... Grab yourself a Bible. Um, 
and get connected. See, the church is so important. Uh, not because the church gets you saved. It's not the church, it's God. But you can learn, you can edify. Edify is a word that means you encourage each other. It helps you to grow when you're around like-minded people, when you're around spirit, spirit-like spirit people, people with the same sort of spirit, people that worship the same God. It helps you to grow. It helps you to, to build a, and also to, have a, 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 to build your character, to be able to serve others and have the same uh, heart as God. It helps you to grow. So connect yourself with a Bible-believing church Spirit-filled church. And congratulations again. I was going to say something else, but we're also, some people are still on lockdown, some churches. Anyways, but just connect yourself with those with people. Even friends that you know that are Christians, get into it. It's important that you maintain that relationship because God is going to take you deeper. He loves, he loves he loves you. It's not a religion. This is a relationship and he wants to take you deeper. He wants to reveal more great things for you. He's got an amazing plan for you and he wants to reveal those things to you. And he wants to use you for his glory, for your benefit. Amen. Okay. Uh, I want to congratulate you once again for the decision you've made. For those that are watching here, we are now going into our collective time. If you want to hang around for the collective time, that'll be awesome. If you don't, that's okay. God bless you. Shalom. Have a great rest of the week. And I'll see you next week. Don't forget to, to come by. But we're going into our collective.